Hey, what's up? Welcome to episode three of Mix in America. This one is titled simply White Privilege. I thought about trying to come up with some sort of clever name, but to be honest with you, I'm just gonna stick exactly what it is, white privilege. I'm just gonna tell you, this is what I'm talking about. This is the conversation today. I wanna discuss white privilege. And I, I'll give you a little fair warning that this is probably gonna be different than how most people talk about white privilege and the way that this uh, phrase is used in 2020 but but i have a different perspective you have a different perspective that's fine uh your perspective might be different because of the color of your skin or where you were raised or your parents or whatever but for me growing up i want to tell you white privilege is basically a curse word all right if you have missed the other episodes or don't understand where i'm coming from my mom is black my dad is white my mom would not let me use the phrase white privilege because my parents taught me that the color of my skin is not an excuse and that I can accomplish whatever plans God has for me. I'm not some poor black man that needs a handout or an affirmative action job to succeed in life. Yes, I understand that my ancestors absolutely went through some stuff and that they had to struggle. And I understand that I struggle and that I've been struggling and I there is a struggle. I understand that completely. But if they could do what they did back when they did it, then what's, what's stopping me from accomplishing everything that God has for me? So what I, what I was kind of taught growing up or what people told me white privilege was, was that because my black family was slaves, they're still trying to catch up. And I'm, I'll admit that there's some truth to that, that there is um, some truth to slavery uh, setting our people back. That's definitely an understatement, maybe the understatement of, of the century. Uh, slavery absolutely set black people back because maybe if you haven't thought much about it, and this is probably more for the white people because black people, we've definitely thought about it before, but um, when blacks were freed, it wasn't like all of a sudden we're equal. You know, not even considering the actual laws that were in place, like separate but equal, Jim Crow, et cetera, those things that were specifically designed to make black people be inferior. Um, just the fact that when a slave was freed, they didn't own any land, they weren't educated, they couldn't read or write. And now all of a sudden, okay, you're free, go do what? So like, it wasn't like they set them up to succeed. That's what, you know, that's what reparations are supposed to be for. Like, ooh, sorry. Also, here's something to help you get on your feet, right? 40 acres and a mule is what they said. Um, obviously that didn't happen. They didn't get reparations. So if you guys wanna blame anyone for whatever this is, people that didn't give reparations back in the day. Back then, maybe it was actually a possibility because you actually knew who was freed slaves. Reparations wouldn't work right now, not just because um, a lot of people couldn't really track their family history to being slaves, but you know, I, I'm I'm half black. Does my my dad owe my mom money? You know, how many people have come? Our black people have come from Africa since then. So reparations don't work now. I don't know why I went on that rabbit trail, um, but at the time, reparations might not have been a bad idea. So. So absolutely, the freed slaves were at a disadvantage and absolutely that takes time to, to build up um, the accumulation of wealth to pass down something down to your family, right? Um, they didn't have land to pass down and, and not to mention the, the, the family money, the money that was made off of the backs of slaves, white people that made money in America because they didn't have to pay their workforce, right? Absolutely, there was an advantage there. But my point is now, you can recover from it. It might take a lot of time and it definitely takes a lot of hard work, but you can recover. People have. It's happened before. Like not every black person in America that's a descendant of a slave is way back, right? And struggling and poor. And, and I know that's not the case. I know that not all descendants of slaves are still living um, a less privileged li life because of slavery because I'm a descendant of slaves. If you missed that in one of my last episodes, I mentioned I've been to the plantation where my ancestors were slaves. It's in Missouri. It was destroyed in a flood in 1993. But when I was a kid, and I didn't know, I didn't understand this as a kid, they called it the family farm, but we had family reunions on the plantation where my ancestors were slaves. So I, I know for a fact that I'm a descendant of slaves. And I know for a fact that I'm a contributing member of society. And I know for a fact that I'm not held back because of slavery anymore. In fact, I just want to play a little game with you. I know 
this is I know I can't hear you or anything, but uh, get a pen and paper out and, and write down. I just got a couple questions to ask you. Um, we'll call it like the privilege game or I'll, I'll title it which parent was more privileged because I've seen a lot of videos or a lot of like diversity workshops where they say they try to explain white privilege like this and they'll say they'll ask these questions like they'll line them all. I've seen this one where they line them all up, um, everybody, black, white, whatever. And then they, they go through these questions. And if you had this in your life, then you take a step forward. And then they do like a race thing and they see that, oh, all the white people are way up front and all the black people are still in the back. Okay. So I'm going to play that game with you a little bit about my parents. Remember, my mom's black, my dad's white. So which parent do you think stay, had their parents stayed married? So no divorce, no split home. Parents stayed married all their lives. Give you a second to answer. That was my mom. My mom, um, her parents stayed married to the day my, my grandpa died a number of years ago. Um, but she came from a, I'll say a solid two-parent household. My dad did not. His parents divorced when he was young. Number two, parents had advanced education. Give you a second to, hang, to answer that. Also my mom, her dad had a doctorate. Um, I believe uh, my grandma, her mom had at least one master's, um, but they were educated people. Next question, which parent do you think went to private schools growing up? Once again, that was my mom. Uh, my, my grandparents sent all nine of their children to Catholic schools in Minnesota. Um, my dad went to public schools, nothing against public schools. I'm just saying that's, a, that's another one of those questions that you hear people say that is white privilege. Last question, which one of my parents do you think is a college graduate? Went to a four year university, got a college degree. Once again, that was my mom. If that's what you said, all four of those was my mom. So if you looked at that and this is, these are common questions that they use to prove white privilege. My mom was better set up for success in life than my dad. And this is nothing against my dad or his family. We've had these conversations before. He knows this. My mom was set up better for success than my dad was. And you want to talk about the neighborhoods they grew up in? Well, they grew up five minutes from each other in Brooklyn Center. But which parent was better set up for success? It was my black mom was better set up for success than my white dad. So don't, don't tell me that, that my family is worse off or has things more difficult because of slavery. Don't tell me that, that my mom is set back because of slavery. And, I, and I, I'm not saying that that couldn't be the case for some of you, but, but I want you to understand my mom was set up for success because of what, my, what her parents accomplished. And I don't know my grandparents' parents or what position they were in, but my grandfather, a black man, who he had a doctorate, he was an educator, a city counselor, he was a published author and poet, raised nine children, sent them all to Catholic school, and if he could accomplish what he accomplished then, then what's my excuse? If he, as a black man, accomplished everything that he accomplished in his lifetime, when everyone will admit whatever you think the racism problem is at, wherever, wherever you think racism at in America right now, we can all agree it was a whole lot worse than my grandpa was growing up. And he was able to accomplish what he accomplished. So don't tell me that the racism in 2020 is what's holding me back. Don't tell me that, that a, a descendant of a slave can't accomplish things, can't break out of a poverty cycle. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. You know, you've probably heard the saying before, you have to work twice as hard to get half as far. And maybe my grandpa did. Maybe my grandpa got where he was because he worked twice as hard as the next guy. And maybe if he was white, he wouldn't have had to work as hard or maybe he would have gone further, right? I know that he actually ran for uh, mayor of Brooklyn Center at some point and supposedly he lost only by a few votes and it was supposedly because he was black. So you know what? Maybe if my grandpa was white, he could have been mayor of Brooklyn Center. Maybe he could have accomplished more. Maybe he could have written more books or more, more poetry. But you know what? He still accomplished a lot. 
if he could accomplish what he accomplished, what's my excuse? Having to work twice as hard to get half as far should not be a reason to give up. It should just make you work that much harder. The truth is some people in life have advantages. Life isn't fair. I'll use sports as an example because that's what I always do. When I played sports, there were absolutely people who were more naturally gifted than me, who had more athleticism, more God-given talent. I had to work real hard just to make the team. And there were people that could, especially in high school, could skate by on talent alone. But it didn't stop me from working. It shouldn't make you give up. It just makes you work harder. You know, the example that I use in my book about this was Adam Thielen and, and Cordero Patterson. Not saying that Adam Thielen's not athletic, because he actually is pretty athletic. Let's be honest, people like to say that he's not because he's white, but he is athletic. He does have some speed, but but it's not, but Cord he's not Cordero Patterson athletic. Cordero Patterson is a freak of nature athlete. Like he he's more athletic than a whole lot of people in professional sports. So St. Adam Thielen's not as athletic as Cordero Patterson is by no means an insult. But you look at those two came to the Vikings at the same time, 2013. Cordero Patterson was the number one pick out of Tennessee, a power five school. Adam Thielen was undrafted out of Minnesota State Mankato from a small town in Minnesota, didn't have the offers, uh, obviously had to you know just make the team in rookie minicamp. Cordero Patterson was much more set up for success in the NFL than Adam Thielen. But Adam Thielen absolutely outworked Cordero Patterson. And I don't even mean this as an insult to Cordero Patterson because Adam Thielen might outwork everybody in the NFL. He earned a spot on the roster, first on the practice squad, then the active roster, special teams, uh, third, fourth receiver, eventually starter, pro bowler. Adam Thielen absolutely worked his way to now I think he's a top 10 receiver in the league and earned a spot in the Minnesota Vikings with a good contract why Cordero Patterson has kind of bounced around the league for a while. I think he's with the Bears right now, um, but absolutely has not blossomed. I mean, he has not had the success in this league like Adam Thielen has had, and Adam Thielen has absolutely had to work harder than him. The truth is some people have more God-given talent, and some people have to work really hard to even make the team. And in life, some people are just born into better situations, into wealthy or influential families, right? Say what you want about Joe Buck. I'm not saying he's not talented. I'm not saying he didn't work really hard to get to where he is. But the broadcaster, Joe Buck, his success was at least in part due to the fact that his dad was a famous, talented broadcaster. Um, Larry Fitzgerald, one of my favorite football players ever, Minneapolis kid. Um, he was a ball boy for the Vikings because of his dad's connections. His dad was in the media. His dad knew some people and was able to get him that uh, position as a ball boy for the 98 Vikings, and I'm not saying that he wouldn't have still been great, maybe still one of the best receivers ever, but hanging out with Randy Moss and Chris Carter when he was in high school probably didn't hurt his chances. Because he was a ball boy, he got to hang out with those guys and learn from some of the best, truly the best to ever do it. So when I think about privilege, I love what, there was a guest speaker at our church that we went to back in San Diego, Rock Church, San Diego. Um, and he said, guest speaker, I don't remember his name, I feel bad because I should give him credit for this. Um, but he's probably not the only one that's ever said it. But the first time I heard it was he said privilege is a spectrum. So he, so he said he looked white, so he had some advantage there. But he had a Mexican-sounding name, which gave him some disadvantage. He was also raised by a single mom. I don't remember all the other stuff that he talked about on what were advantages and disadvantages. And I thought about it, and you know, I like that. And I think I'm going to stick with that. I think if someone wants to talk about privilege, I, I agree privilege is a spectrum. And I think of it as a spectrum. I do recognize that the lightness of my skin can be a privilege at some point because I've been pulled over quite a few times, especially when I was younger. I don't think it was ever because of the color of my skin because I don't think a cop seeing me driving by could tell that I was actually black um, with how light I am. Maybe not, maybe in August, but I, I don't think I've been followed in a store because of the color of my skin. Now, it may have been because of the way I dress or did dress, I guess, maybe I'm a little more, but I do wear Jordans, I wear flat brim hats. You know, back in the day, I wore baggy jeans and throwback jerseys. So there's a chance that I got followed or got profiled because of that. Um, but I had, that had more to do with probably the way I dressed and the music I listened to with my subs in the back versus necessarily the color of my skin. But I do understand that there is an advantage because, you know, when I'm walking through a rich neighborhood, I don't think I'm getting the police called on me just because of the color of my skin. 
So I absolutely understand some advantage, but, but like I said, it's a spectrum, right? My mom had more advantage than my dad. If you look at the spectrum, yeah, there was maybe, maybe the color of my dad's skin helped him uh, in certain areas or something. I don't know, but my mom had more privilege than my dad. And that's a fact. So I recognize that advantage and that privilege is a spectrum, but I still hate the term white privilege. And honestly, I need someone to explain to me how that term doesn't fuel white supremacy. Because if you look at that, what that term means, it's saying that you're better than me because you're white. You have advantages in life because you're white. How does that not at worst fuel white supremacy saying that white people are inherently better, but then even more, how does that, I guarantee you that, again, my perspective, that doesn't make me feel better as a black man for you to tell me that your life is better because you're white. It, there's a, that's, how does a black person grow up hearing that and how do they go out and accomplish things and, and think that, that they can overcome this if they're constantly being told they're lesser because of the color of their skin? And the truth is that comes, the white privilege thing comes from a lot of white people trying to do the right thing. I feel like it's a lot of time, it's the, peop the, the white people that really like feel bad for black people. Um, so they, they want to admit their white privilege. But let me talk to my black people for a second. Do not see white privilege as an excuse. Do not listen to them when they tell you that they are better set up for success because they are white. Do not let that be an excuse. Even if you have to work twice as hard to get half as far, do not use that as an excuse. This is my, I'll call it an impassioned plea to call the black community to do better, to be better. And I understand that might upset some people and offend some people, and I don't mean that. And I understand that it can be difficult, but white privilege is not an excuse. You are not lesser because of the color of your skin. There are people in life that have advantages, whether it's money, or an influential family, or the area they were born in, or let's be honest, the privilege of being born in America is a huge privilege that I, I was set up for success better than most of the world because I was born here in America, and that is something I had nothing to do with, right? But if I can take a minute and talk to my white friends for a second, because Pastor Miles, our, our pastor at a church back in San Diego, wrote a book, The Third Option, can't recommend it more, um, it's really, really good. It's called The Third Option by Pastor Miles McPherson. And in his book, he talks about something that, that explains white privilege in a way that makes some sense to me. I still don't like the term white privilege. I still don't use that as an excuse for me. But to the white people that, that completely ignore white privilege and think there is no advantage to being white, he used this analogy. And it was the idea of he's left-handed. So he was so what he says is the world was created by right-handed people for right-handed people. Everything from scissors to your desk at school where the little arm extension comes out. Uh, he talked about how for him being left-handed that was difficult. And my wife is left-handed, so we talked about this and she said absolutely there are th plenty of things in life that are more difficult because you're left-handed. I'm right-handed. I don't even think about that. I go to the, if I need a pair of scissors, I go to the store and buy a pair of scissors, right? I, everything is, most of society is set up to function as right-handed. So I don't even think about it until he pointed that out to me or until someone points that out to me, right? If you're white and you don't think there's any privilege to the color of your skin, I want you to understand that you live, if you live here in America, you live in a society that was created by white people for white people. Yes, a lot of laws have changed and there's been a ton of progress and I will never have a race conversation without first recognizing the progress that my ancestors made. And I don't think in 2020, there are laws in place in America that overtly directly hinder black people and minorities, but the original setup of this country was by white men who thought it was okay to own another person just because their skin was darker. So I need you to understand that. I don't need an apology. 
I don't need your pity. In fact, I almost titled this, I don't need your pity, I don't want your pity. Because as a black man, even if I have to work harder, I'm still gonna work hard and I'm gonna accomplish everything God has set out for me to do. Join me next week, I think I'm gonna talk about identity because it, all of us, anyone growing up, identity, it, it can be a struggle, but even more so when you're mixed, um, that's, a, that's a really big deal. Um, if you're mixed, you know that. If you know mixed people, you've probably heard it too. Identity is a big deal. Thanks again for listening and join me next week for episode four of Mixed in America. Hey, thanks for watching my video. I hope you liked it. If you did, can you do three things for me? Can you like the video, subscribe to my channel, and tell your friends.